World War II was a global experiment in armor technology. One major power still relied on archaic rivets that turn into shrapnel when hit. Another bet everything on engineering perfection, only to find their steel shattering like glass. In this video, we will find out which nations actually built the best armor of the war. In the desert of North Africa, brave Italian crews were sent to fight British Matildas and American Shermans in vehicles that were essentially riveted coffins. The archaic vertical slab design offered zero geometric advantage against high-velocity shells. Minimal obliquity left Italian tanks vulnerable to standard Allied anti-tank fire. Italian doctrine dictated all-around protection, but without hard glazes, Thin 42mm frontal plates allowed even lightweight two-pounder guns to penetrate effortlessly. Italian tanks often had unreinforced driver slots and exposed turret rings created fatal stress risers, while bolted hatches tend to buckle under impact, which compromised structural integrity in combat. Lacking nickel and molybdenum, brittle high-carbon steel armor shattered upon impact. Most hits caused lethal spalling that disabled crews without full penetration. Italian tanks also had ballistically inferior riveting that failed under kinetic shock. Sheared rivet heads became supersonic internal projectiles and turned the tank's construction against its crew. Artisanal craft-based production of Italian tanks precluded interchangeability. Inflexible tooling forced the continued manufacture of obsolete chassis well into 1942. Overall, Italian tanks represented the absolute floor of World War II armor technology. Their crews fought a modern war in brittle, unsloped, bolted tanks with 1920s technology that proved an utter failure. The Imperial Army's armor was the neglected stepchild of the Japanese war effort. Designed for infantry support in China, these tanks were never meant to trade shots with Allied tanks. We're going to look at what happens when a nation possessing advanced naval and aviation technology refused to share a single scrap of it with tank designers. Modest curves of Japanese tanks deflected small arms, but failed against high-velocity rounds. The zero-degree hull virtually guaranteed Allied penetration. Uniformly thin armor was vulnerable to even 50 caliber armor piercing rounds, and Sherman high explosive rounds easily shattered the lightweight hulls. Protruding machine gun mounts and pistol ports created stress risers. Starved of naval grade alloys, Japanese tanks had inconsistent high carbon steel that lacked toughness. Brittle plates shattered like ceramic and caused frequent internal spalling. Predominantly riveted construction of Japanese tanks created ballistic hazards. Impact shockwaves sheared rivets into projectiles, and late war tanks with welded designs arrived too late. Fragmented batch production of Japanese tank factories was negligible compared to other countries' output. Most resources were diverted to ships and aircraft. Japanese edged out Italy with better late war medium tanks, but their armor technology was ultimately limited by resource starvation and rigid light tank doctrine. Next, we are looking at a nation that pioneered the cast turret and the heavy tank concept. French designers created monsters that German 37mm anti-tank guns couldn't scratch. They had the thickness and the casting technology to win the war, so why does their armor philosophy rank so low? Early adoption of cast compound curves deflected German shells effectively, despite occasional shot traps and inconsistent geometry. Exceptional 60mm frontal and heavy side plating rendered the Char B1 bis heavy tank functionally immune to standard German anti-tank fire. Monolithic cast turrets of some French tanks eliminated seam weaknesses. Though high-profile cupolas and poor ergonomic layouts compromised situational awareness and combat efficiency. Reliable metallurgy of French tanks absorbed energy well, though casting porosity and reduced effectiveness were compensated through sheer bulk. Complex assembly of bolted cast sections required high precision fitting, making field repairs nearly impossible and driving high non-combat losses. Despite the war had been declared since 1939, low volume, high precision manufacturing caused agonizingly slow output in French factories and failed to meet the critical demands of the 1940 campaign. French tanks dominated early axis designs through brute force casting. Thick monolithic armor provided immunity, but it was not enough to compensate for French strategic failures. British Chefneft steel was arguably the highest quality armor plate in Europe, yet they refused to angle it. Hamstrung by rigid doctrine and boxy engineering, some British tanks relied on brute force thickness to survive. Prioritizing internal volume over ballistics, British engineers relied on vertical plates. 
lack of slope designs offered minimal deflection against enemy fire until late war designs arrived. British Army's infantry tank doctrine dictated tanks with massive frontal thickness, including the Churchill, which exceeded the Tiger I. However, inefficient vertical layouts resulted in excessive weight. Vision slots on British tanks weakened structure, while exposed turret rings and mantlet designs risked shock traps and jammed turrets. British armor is manganese steel that offers superior ductility. It prevented cracking and spalling under heavy impact. However, agonizingly slow transition to welding meant reliance on complex bolted frames. This caused sheared fasteners to become internal projectiles. Non-standardized British tank designs created logistical nightmares and prevented streamlined efficiency achieved by U.S. or Soviet production lines. Britain surpassed France by superior metallurgy, and their world-class Sheffield steel provided durability. Yet they both still adopted archaic boxy geometry. The Soviets didn't just build a tank, they weaponized mass production and geometry. By introducing the 60-degree slope, they rendered an entire generation of German tanks obsolete overnight. The Soviets revolutionized warfare with the T-34 that delivered superior protection despite crude manufacturing. Revolutionary slope designs doubled effective thickness and induced ricochets. It rendered vertical armor of Panzer III and Panzer IV obsolete, which forced Germany to adopt similar designs. Soviet tanks sacrificed sight protection for massive frontal thickness. This allowed heavier guns and better mobility on lighter, optimized chassis. However, mass production shortcuts in tank factories left many flaws. For example, the Glace's driver's hatch ruined ballistic integrity, while turret shot traps deflected shells downward. High hardness armor with heat treatment resisted perforation but caused brittleness. Rush production often led to inconsistent plates that shattered and spalled. Agricultural rough weld in tank factories ensured speed and mass production. Soviet optimized tank designs for maximum output. Standardization was prioritized to produce overwhelming volume and crush German forces through superior numbers. Soviet armor technology surpassed the UK by proving design geometry can beat material quality. Their sloped armor rendered vertical plates obsolete. Soviet tanks won the war through optimized design despite rough manufacturing. German heavy tanks were the benchmark by which all other World War II armor is measured. But behind the terrifying silhouette lies a darker reality of resource strangulation. German doctrine prioritized engineering perfection, believing one superior tank equaled five enemy tanks. While early Panzers had inefficient vertical plates, the Panther and Tiger II radically adopted Soviet-inspired sloping. The Panther's 55-degree glacis armor ensured deflection. Tanks like the Panther and Jager Tiger featured near-invulnerable glacis plates, turning them into mobile bunkers against Allied guns. German engineers rigorously eliminated weak points, for example by using Scherzen spaced armor and face-hardened MG mounts. Early war face-hardened armor was the gold standard. However, as Allied blockades strangled molybdenum and nickel supplies, late war steel became dangerously brittle. Germany mastered Zappenverbindung, or interlocking plates using mortise and tenon joints to maximize weld surface area and to better transfer kinetic energy. German manufacturing was more handcrafted than industrial. Constant mid-production design changes and over-engineered designs like interleave wheels created logistical nightmares. Germany surpasses the Soviet Union by refining sloped armor with engineering precision. By combining thick armor, efficient sloping, and seamless durability, they briefly achieved perfection. For many years, we have heard that it took five Shermans to kill a tiger. But the U.S. proved that victory was achieved not through thickness, but through metallurgical consistency. The Sherman utilized 50-degree sloping offering around 93mm effective thickness, which was adequate for a medium tank. The M4A1 single-piece cast hull introduced ballistic rounding, naturally varying impact angles. U.S. doctrine emphasized mobile warfare over static duels. Unlike German and Soviet heavy tanks, Shermans maintained more balance all-around protection. The most critical survival upgrade during the war was wet stowage, which reduced catastrophic fire rates from 80% to 15% after penetration. Secure access to nickel and molybdenum made American metallurgy highly consistent. Unlike brittle German plates, U.S. steel remained highly ductile. U.S. uniquely mass-produced both fully cast holes and automated welded holes. Casting methods created perfect ballistic curves without seams, while advanced automated welding eliminated the structural risks. 
the U.S. takes the crown by proving industrial consistency beats theoretical perfection. Rich in nickel and molybdenum, American steel was the most ductile. Combining French casting method, Soviet slope design, and industrial standardization, the U.S. produced many thousands of metallurgically consistent holes, earning the top spot. Thank you for watching, and see you in our next videos.